Psalm 110 is one of the greatest and most important psalms in the entire collection of the 150 psalms. Now, I know that's a big statement, but let's talk about it piece by piece. First, if you take a look at the psalm, you'll see that the psalm carries the simple title, A Psalm of David. Now, strangely, some scholars and commentators through the centuries have denied the authorship of King David, David the son of Jesse, over Psalm 110. Yet, as the commentator Derek Kidner noted, he said that the Lord Jesus gave absolutely full weight to the idea of David's authorship when he quoted this psalm and attributed it to David in Mark chapter 12. So really, we have both the double testimony of the psalm itself and the testimony of the Lord Jesus himself telling us that this is, in fact, a psalm of David. Now, what makes Psalm 110 so special, so remarkable? Well, this is one of the Old Testament portions most quoted in the New Testament. The commentator James Montgomery Boyce counted 27 direct quotations or indirect allusions. 27 of Psalm 110 in the New Testament somewhere. This is an incredible, Messiah-glorifying, Jesus Christ-glorifying psalm. And let's take a look at this short seven-verse psalm, piece by piece, by beginning now with the first two verses. It's going to begin a section where we're talking about the character of the Messiah. So here we go. Psalm 110, the first two verses. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord shall send the rod of your strength out of Zion. Rule in the midst of your enemies. David prophetically reveals something to us in Psalm 110, verse 1. He reveals to us a conversation that happened outside the normal hearing of humanity, and it happened within the Godhead. Let me explain to you what I mean. Look again at verse 1. The Lord said to my Lord. These are a prophetically revealed expression of the words of Yahweh. Now that's the Lord first mentioned in verse one. In my Bible and probably most of yours, Lord there is written in all capital letters, which means that it's representing the Hebrew name Yahweh. So Yahweh spoke something to the Messiah, who here in verse one is referred to as David's Lord. Now. This is clear, not only from the context right here in Psalm 110, but especially by how this verse is quoted in the New Testament. And before I talk about the significance of this, of Yahweh speaking to the Messiah, and that we have an insight into this conversation, it is absolutely amazing to think that through his prophets, and by the way, don't make any mistake, David was many things. He was the great psalmist of Israel. He was a great warrior. Uh, he was a great king, but he was also a prophet. And through David the prophet, God allowed us to hear a private conversation between God the Father and God the Son, that is the Messiah, Jesus Christ. And this very first verse of Psalm 110 is one of the Old Testament verses most quoted in the New Testament. Now, Jesus quoted Psalm 110, verse 1, The Lord said to my Lord, in uh, Matthew chapter 22, verses 43 through 45. By the way, the parallel passage of that is Mark chapter 12, verses 36 and 37. And there, Jesus quotes it to show how David could call the Messiah the Lord, recognizing that the Messiah was greater than David himself. So that's one place where it's quoted in the New Testament, Matthew chapter 22 and the parallel passage in Mark 12. 
Peter quoted this passage on the day of Pentecost, explaining how David prophesied the deity and the ascension of Jesus. That's in Acts chapter 2. Paul referred to Psalm 110 verse 1 in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 25, explaining the rule and the dominion of Jesus the Messiah. The author of the Hebrews quoted it in Hebrews 1.13, referring to the superiority of Jesus the Messiah over any angel. And then finally, the author of Hebrews referred to it again in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 13, explaining the rule and the dominion of Jesus the Messiah. So right there, we have five New Testament quotations of the first verse of Psalm 110 alone. And let's take a look at what is said here. First of all, the Lord, Yahweh, said to my Lord, the Messiah, and this shows us that Yahweh, the covenant God of Israel, spoke to someone that David himself called Lord, Adonai. And this demonstrates that both Yahweh and Adonai, in Psalm 110 verse 1, are mentioned as God in this first verse. Now, let's get down very specifically. Specifically speaking, we would say that Yahweh is the triune God with reference to the person of the Father, the person of the Son, and the person of the Holy Spirit, each being Yahweh. There are references, especially when you compare the Old Testament with the New Testament, where God the Father claims to be Yahweh, God the Son claims to be Yahweh, and God the Holy Spirit claims to be Yahweh. I would define Yahweh as the triune God. Yet, normally, when Yahweh is mentioned without specific connection to the person of the Father or the person of the Holy Spirit, we can assume, it doesn't always work out this way, but we can assume that it refers to God the Father. Therefore, what we have here in Psalm 110, verse 1, the Lord said to my Lord, what we have is we have God the Father speaking to the Messiah, God the Son. And what did he say? Look at the next line of verse 1. Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Yahweh, specifically God the Father in this context, spoke to the Messiah, specifically God the Son, Jesus Christ, telling him to take his enthroned place until the Father provided the complete victory for the Son. Again, I'm just stunned by this, that God prophetically, through the prophet David, gave us this a listening ear to a conversation that happened perhaps before the worlds were ever created where God the Father said to God the Son, hey, you sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. You see, the whole idea of sit at my right hand is a prophetic expectation of the finished work of the Messiah. As Charles Spurgeon said, he said this, his work is done and he may sit. It is well done and he may sit at his right hand. It will have grand results and he may therefore quietly wait to see the complete victory which is certain to follow. And the whole idea of making your enemies your footstool speaks of placing the Messiah's enemy in a lowly place of servitude and submission. And then it continues on here into verse 2, where it says, The Lord shall send the rod of your strength out of Zion. You see, the Messiah's authority would not be limited to Israel. That strength, that authority of the rod would extend out of Zion. It would extend to the entire world dominating all the kings in all the nations of the earth, giving Jesus the Messiah rule over all enemies. So there's a lot packed just into the first two verses of Psalm 110. 
God the Father speaks to God the Son. And so there's at least a bare outline or inkling of the Trinity right there. We have an announcement of the finished work of the Messiah and his ultimate victory, not only over the people of Israel, but extending to all the earth. Now we continue on verse 3, how the Messiah shall be recognized and honored by his people. This is how Yahweh continues speaking prophetically through David in verse 3. Your people shall be volunteers in the day of your power, in the beauties of holiness from the womb of the morning, you have the dew of your youth. Now notice this. God the Father says to God the Son, your people shall be volunteers in the day of your power. Again, that's verse 3. When the people of God see and experience the victory of their Messiah, they will gladly give themselves to his work. They will be willing in the day of his power. Now, by the way, the Hebrew word that's translated power here is the word for a army or a host, to use an older word. The idea is that the Messiah's people are gathered together as a willing army. Your people shall be volunteers in the day of your power. By the way, isn't that a wonderful phrase there? Volunteers. Volunteers. It shows that Jesus Christ is looking for volunteers, people who freely choose to associate with him and to align themselves with his magnificent cause. I like what James Montgomery Boyce had to say about that idea of volunteers. He said, there are no mercenaries in this battle, no slaves pressed into the ranks of Jesus' soldier. This army is composed entirely of volunteers. Now, they can continue on here, or I should say God the Father continues on speaking to God the Son in verse 3, where he says in the last line, you have the dew of your youth. The people of God are there are praising their victorious Messiah, and they are noted for their beautiful holiness. In other words, the Son of God is. The, the, the radiant being of the Messiah, the womb of the morning, and, and the ageless strength of the Messiah, the dew of his youth. And so here they are willingly joining their cause with that of the Messiah, and they are praising the Messiah for his surpassing beauty. Now, we continue on to verse 4, speaking of what Yahweh will continue to say. Here's verse 4, Psalm 118. The Lord has sworn and will not relent. You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Now, notice, verse 4 begins with a very strong statement. The Lord, and again, you notice in your Bible, it's in all capital letters. That means Yahweh. Yahweh has sworn and will not relent. You know, this means that whatever follows in the rest of verse 4, it puts the statement in the most solemn and strong context possible. Yahweh, and again here, contextually, we would say specifically God the Father, made an oath that would never be annulled. He has sworn and he will not relent. You could say that God pledges his own name with every connotation of what the glorious name of God means. He says, I pledge my very name to this thing that I'm going to explain in the second half of verse 4. And what is the statement that God gives all this assurance that he swears an oath to? Look at here at the end of verse 4. You, now again, this is speaking to the Messiah, the Adonai mentioned in verse 1. You are a priest for ever, according to the order of Melchizedek. This is the oath of Yahweh, again, specifically God the Father, regarding the Messiah, God the Son. He vowed that the Messiah has an eternal priesthood, and that eternal priesthood of the Messiah would be after the pattern, after the order 
of Melchizedek. Now, we'll talk about Melchizedek in just a moment, but notice the first thing. God the Father makes a solemn oath in the presence of all the universe to God the Son, saying, you are a priest forever. It's an eternal priesthood according to the order or pattern of Melchizedek. Now, this man Melchizedek, who is he? Historically speaking, in the Old Testament, Melchizedek is mentioned in a single account. It's really just a few verses in the Old Testament. Genesis chapter 14. And that Genesis chapter 14 account is brief, but it is densely packed with information about Melchizedek. You see, after Abraham defeated the confederation of kings who took his nephew Lot captive, Abraham met with a mysterious priest named Melchizedek, whose name means king of righteousness. That's what the name Melchizedek means. And who was also king over the city of Salem. Now, Salem was an ancient name for the city of Jerusalem. Salem, Jerusalem. Now, since Salem means peace, Melchizedek was the king of righteousness. That's what his name means. He was the king of Jerusalem, and he was the king of peace because he was the king of Salem, peace. And Melchizedek was not merely a worshiper of the true God. That was true, but that's not all that was true. Melchizedek also had the honored title, priest of the most high God. The greatness of God magnified the greatness of Melchizedek's priesthood. He was priest, but not of some imaginary lesser God. Melchizedek was the priest of the most high God. Then continuing on in Genesis 14, we find out that Melchizedek blessed Abraham, and in blessing him, he demonstrated his greatness over Abraham the patriarch. And then Abraham gave Melchizedek a tithe, 10%, a tenth part of all the spoils of battle, and perhaps of everything he possessed. Again, that's mentioned in Genesis chapter 14. And then finally, in the record of Genesis 14, there is absolutely no mention of any father or mother of Melchizedek, and he appears in the biblical record without any genealogy whatsoever. Now, that's sort of the densely packed story of Melchizedek, as we have it in Genesis chapter 14. So now, when David, speaking by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, relays to us, prophetically speaking, this great declaration of God the Father towards God the Son, this declaration that says, you, Messiah, you are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. With that oath, God revealed that there is another order of priesthood apart from the priestly order of Aaron. Now, we, we just need to understand that for someone in the Old Testament, the priesthood expressed through Aaron, the brother of Moses, and all of his descendants, what we might call the Aaronic priesthood, because it was associated back with Aaron, it started with him, the brother of Moses, that priesthood was an extremely important institution in ancient Israel. It was through the sacrifices that the priesthood offered and all the ceremonies and rituals that they carried out that atonement, or at least the idea of atonement, was brought to ancient Israel. And Aaron and his priesthood provided that essential sacrificial system and the administration of it for ancient Israel. So the Israelite priests were all descended from Aaron and they served in the tabernacle later on in the days of Solomon in the temple. They offered sacrifices and they conducted ceremonies according to God's law. But here, again, we're in Psalm 110 verse 4, 
here we see that God established another priestly order, this after the pattern of Melchizedek, by simply saying to God the Son, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Now, this oath that God the Father made to God the Son is so important that the author of Hebrews, if you turn on later on to to the book of Hebrews in your New Testament, the author of Hebrews refers to this oath five times. Twice in Hebrews chapter 5, once in Hebrews chapter 6, and twice again in Hebrews chapter 7. Now, the two references in Hebrews chapter 5, verses 5 and 6 and verse 10, emphasize that this was Yahweh's declaration, that it was not something that the Messiah claimed for himself. That's very important in the mind of the New Testament. That Jesus did not say, hey, I want to be a priest. Let me be a priest. No, this was God the Father's declaration over God the Son. You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Then in Hebrews chapter 6, that's in verse 20, the emphasis there is on the idea that Jesus the Messiah serves now and forever as a living active high priest for his people. Brothers and sisters, this is one of the most glorious things for us to ever remember, that Jesus is our high priest. And again, you can imagine a Jewish person objecting to the idea that Jesus could be our high priest. They would say, he's not descended from Aaron. Instead, he comes from the tribe of Judah, from the lineage of King David, the author of this psalm. But here we find out that Jesus' priesthood is not according to the lineage of Aaron, but as powerfully and beautifully declared in Psalm 110, verse 4, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. That's the emphasis in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 20. Then in Hebrews chapter 7, verse 17, there the emphasis is on the idea that the priesthood of Jesus the Messiah is according to the order of Melchizedek and it is better than the priestly order of Aaron because it's eternal and it will never end. Again, notice those lines from verse 4. You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Now, whatever you want to say about the Aaronic priesthood is even though there may be people today on the earth, I'm sure there are, who are descended from Aaron and who are genetically qualified to be priests according to the order of Aaron, there is no priesthood. There's no functioning priesthood. The priesthood of Melchizedek perfected and expressed through Jesus Christ has never ended and will never end. He is a priest forever. And then finally, in Hebrews chapter 7, verse 21, this emphasizes the idea that the priesthood of Jesus the Messiah, according to the order of Melchizedek, is better than the priestly order of Aaron because it's founded on a direct oath of Yahweh, unlike the priestly order of Aaron. So in all of these ways, the priesthood of Jesus Christ according to the order of Melchizedek, is superior. It's better than the priesthood of Aaron. I like what the old Anglican commentator George Horn had to say about this. He said simply, his priesthood is not like that of Aaron, figurative, successive, and transient, but it is real and effectual, fixed and incommunicable, eternal and unchangeable. That's a great description of the priesthood of Aaron. Okay, continuing on here now. Verse 5 begins to describe the conquest of the Messiah. So the first four verses describe these amazing words that Yahweh, specifically God the Father, spoke to Adonai, specifically God the Son, the Messiah. Here in verse 5, we have glorious words spoken regarding the Messiah. Here we go, verse 5. The Lord is at your right hand. He shall execute kings in the day of his wrath. 
Notice this, verse 5. The Lord is at your right hand. The favor and strength of the Messiah, your right hand, is aligned with, and it's an instrument of, the strength of God. So the Lord, here that mentioned in verse 5, I believe is a reference to Yahweh. Again, the word there is Adonai, but it's used in the general sense of God. It's speaking of him being at the right hand of the Messiah. And what is the Messiah doing there? He shall execute kings in the day of his wrath. Now, this second part of the psalm brings Messiah the king and priest into the battlefield. He comes forth from the throne. He's no longer seated at the moment in the consideration of verse 5 at Yahweh's right hand. Now, the Lord stands at his right hand as the battle is fought against the kings of the earth to bring God's judgment against them. Look at that line there at verse 5. He shall execute kings. Here he's using the authority that was mentioned first in verse 2. Um, the Lord shall send the rod of your strength out of Zion, rule in the midst of your enemies, that authority is exercised in verse 5, where it says he shall execute kings. That authority of the Messiah is extended out of Zion, and it brings the righteous judgment of God against even the greatest of kings. Now, back to verses 6 and 7, with which we will conclude the text of this psalm. It speaks of the wonderful judgment of the Messiah. Here we go, verse 6. He shall judge among the nations. He shall fill the places with dead bodies. He shall execute the heads of many countries. He shall drink of the brook by the wayside. Therefore, he shall lift up the head. These are heavy verses. You know, earlier in Psalm 110, we have this high, beautiful theology about the Trinity and Yahweh saying to the Messiah, calling him Lord, about the priesthood of the Messiah according to the order of Melchizedek and all that's carried with it. We have so much beautiful theology in the first part of the psalm. Now, by the time we get to verse 6, the judgment of the Messiah is present and it's a sobering phrase. Verse 6, he shall fill the places with dead bodies. In his conquest, the Messiah will exercise his authority over all nations. He will bring his righteous judgment. And even if it means to fill the battlefield of Armageddon with dead bodies, as is related to us in Revelation chapter 16 and chapter 19, it shows that there will be a great authoritative judgment of the Messiah. Now, that's what he'll do to his enemies. But look at the last line of the psalm, what he shall do for his friends. It says that he shall drink of the brook by the wayside. Therefore, he shall lift up the head. While the rebellious nations of the world receive their judgment, the Messiah himself is refreshed. He shall drink of the brook by the wayside. And he's exalted, he shall lift up the head. And perhaps the idea there is he shall even lift up the head of his people, his associates, those who of his people were his volunteers in the day of his power. Whatever way you want to slice it. This psalm speaks of the complete victory of the Messiah over everything every enemy and over every adverse circumstance. It's a glorious, glorious, it's a glorious, powerful, I was trying to combine the two words glorious and powerful there. It's a glorious and powerful psalm speaking of the great exaltation of Jesus. Now, there's a lot in just those seven verses of Psalm 110. And we'll do with this as we've done at the end of, I suppose, most every psalm as we've walked our way through the psalms here. We ask ourselves the question, how does Psalm 110 point to Jesus? How does it point to Jesus? Brother, sister, let me just say, how doesn't the psalm point to Jesus? 
Again, this is probably the Old Testament passage most quoted in the New Testament. By one count, that of the commentator James Montgomery Boyce, there are 27 direct quotations or direct allusions to Psalm 110 somewhere in the New Testament. Matter of fact, you could say that we see Jesus exalted in every verse of Psalm 110. Seven verses? Let's look for seven ways that Jesus is exalted in this psalm. First of all, Jesus is God, seen in verse 1, the Lord said to my Lord. Secondly, Jesus is king, as seen in verse 2, where it says, he will rule in the midst of your enemies. Third, Jesus is the captain of his people, as seen in verse 3. Your people shall be volunteers in the day of your power. Fourth, Jesus is our high priest, as seen in verse 4. You are a priest forever. Fifth, Jesus is our returning conqueror. It's seen in verse 5. He shall execute kings in the day of his wrath. Six, Jesus is the judge of all the earth. Again, as seen in verse 6, he shall judge among the nations. And then finally, Jesus is exalted above all, as seen in verse 7. He shall lift up the head. We take all of this collectively and we say, how beautiful, how wonderful, how glorious that God were through David as a prophet, to give us a powerful and beautiful declaration of this conversation that happened behind the veil in the courts of heaven. The Lord has said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Let's thank the Lord for such a glorious psalm and how it speaks to us so powerfully of Jesus Christ, our Messiah. Lord, we do thank you. We see the power, the deity, the authority, the priesthood, the glory, the judgment, the the exaltation of Jesus Christ in Psalm 110, and it stirs our hearts to sing. It stirs our hearts to give you glory, and we do, Lord. We give you glory for your unbelievably wise and amazing plan through which you are bringing out something beautiful, something powerful through your plan, through the work of Jesus, who is both God and Messiah. You are bringing forth this people to join his cause, to be his willing volunteers on the day of battle. Lord, I pray that everyone who listens to this would take the spirit that's reflected to us in these verses where it simply says, your people shall be volunteers in the day of your power. Help us to respond to this exaltation of Jesus by saying, Lord, with all that we have in our being, we want to join our cause to his. We give you this with all glory and honor in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.